Morning, 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 everybody. How are you? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I am Sean Butler. Bugsy Malone is right down there. She's on the march looking for squirrels. I hope you're on the march looking for health and happiness in all of your pursuits. Guys, please do me a favour. Smash the like button for me on the video like you always do. Smash the subscribe on the channel if you haven't already. We're about four people away from 15,100, which would be really cool to uh, hit. Also, if you don't mind, I'm still going to be pursuing this. In the title of the page, you'll see the link to Sean Butler TV. If you haven't already, we'd really appreciate it if you could just hit the subscribe to that. Uh, there's no content on there yet, but there will be at some point, um, depending on where it goes with regards new new concepts. So it'd be awesome to get a rolling start. Uh, so if you don't mind, that would be cool as a cucumber of you. Also drop a comment, of course, and let me uh, know your thoughts on today's video. We've got lots of news to get through, guys. Lots of transfer news, views and clues regarding four or five different players. Let's start with all of them named for you. So you can jump ahead using the chapters if you are more interested in one over the other. We've got Wilfred Nonto, Gnonto, the Leeds United Italian international. We have Evan Ferguson. We have Gift Orban. And we have Everici Eze. Four interesting names. Let's start with Gnonto. Um, news broke yesterday that Tottenham were monitoring the situation. Everton are the front runners for his signature. I only really caught an article, one article really, and that was from the Goodison News, I think it's called, which is obviously an Everton, an Everton blog, a uh, popular Everton blog. And they were saying that Tottenham, they were referencing people on Twitter that are saying that Tottenham are monitoring the, uh, the, the situation, that Leeds probably want something like 30 million pound for the 19 year old. Morning guys. Morning. And that that's probably too much for Everton. If that's what, according to the article, if that's what is necessary to get the job done, then Everton won't be able to get it done. And Tottenham, who are second in the race at the moment for him, would take over. Um, outside chance of a loan deal being done, loan with obligations or loan with options to buy, depending on um, the, the structure of those deals. Obviously, you know the, the player doesn't want to stay and play in the championship. He's far too good for that. What I would say though is that my personal belief on him is that he is probably at the moment the right standard for a lower league, lower half, sorry, of the Premier League team. I don't really think he's done anything that is measurable or memorable to the point where he's ready for the next step. And if Tottenham and themselves are trying to close the gap on those above, then to me it doesn't make a lot of sense. I'll put some of the stats up on the screen so you can see them. In terms of what he did last season for Leeds, look, he's a nice eye test sort of player. Gets the ball, he drives with it. He's got a low center of gravity, very tricky, can run, can use both feet. You know, I think he scored a couple of goals. I think he only started 14 games in a struggling Leeds team. Only played about 1400 minutes worth of action. And for what it's worth, when I'm filtering on the Y Scout tool to look for players with the stats that we're looking for for certain holes, I use a minimum of 2,000 minutes um, over the last year so that I know that the sample size is large enough to kind of uh, to take the stats more seriously. And so he wouldn't even appear in a filtering session if I was looking for him. But FB reps um, kind of suggest that, that he's sort of bang average at uh, most things. And the only thing you can really note about him, I guess, is that from, a, from a, an offensive winger's perspective, he's pretty good at the, the defensive responsibilities, getting back, pressuring, recoveries, tackles, that sort of stuff. He's up there um, in the kind of the, uh, the upper quartile, the upper 20% for those sorts of actions. And he's good with progressive carries and progressive receptions, you know, those sorts of things he's good at. But in terms of the final, the final piece of the puzzle, never really looked like he um, kind of materialised or, or, or converted too many of the opportunities. Obviously it's difficult for, when you're looking at teams that are struggling and you're looking for positive actions from players, sometimes you have to bake into that, you know, that, the context there. But actually Leeds generally were a team that last season were able to create quite a lot of opportunities. And so 
the fact that he didn't get that many starts, that many minutes, I don't know. To me, I just think good player and I'm sure we'll have a great career. He's only 19, but I, I just don't see the, the value in buying uh, buying him. I don't see the value in spending 30 million pounds of our precious budget on a player like that. There's better players out there that um, you know are just as dangerous, that don't cost a lot. Manuel Solomon is a perfect example of one, very similar sort of player. One costs nothing at all. Are we really going to spend 30 million pound on Gonzo? I'm giving it a wah wah. I don't believe the story to be true. I'd be very surprised if anything happened there. Moving on to Ian Ferguson, Evan Ferguson, I beg your pardon, a, uh, a player that a lot of people are massively into. I was on a show with the Irish Hotspur yesterday, Gavin Brains McLeod was all over it saying we should go and bid 80 million pound for Evan Ferguson. For me, he's nowhere near 80 million pound player yet. He might well be in the future, but you can't pay to future prices that are based on that level of, of excellence. Like you could pay, if you're paying 40 million pound for him now, that is still based on future excellence. But you have to leave a little bit of wiggle room and 80 million pound for a player that's done, you know, he's had a good run when he's played for Brighton, but he's nowhere near the finished article. For me, is madness. It doesn't really matter anyway. The news out in that regard. Um, Tony Bloom's uh, partner in crime, the the kind of the, I think that's the chairman of the of the of the group. I forget his name. Um, I read an article this morning. He was talking about Evan Ferguson on Talksport and was saying. We have had inquiries, uh, but we've, we've knocked them back. We're not interested. We won't be selling Evan Ferguson for about five years when asked when would be the right time to sell him. So on that note, I think we just put that story to bed, even though other reporters are saying that it was Tottenham that actually reached out to Bryson to see and to test the waters or to inquire about his availability. And in a nutshell, the story seems to be that Brighton have got no interest in selling him and if you know they were to sell him now it would have to take some obscene figure and we know Brighton don't mess around when they want their price they ask for their price and more often than not they get it but I just don't see it happening so my advice is if you've got a list of strikers and he's on it I think it's time to chalk him off because I just don't think it's plausible Another two other players that we are looking at, um, Gift Orban, the uh, Tavalieri, the, the, the journalist who has been sort of promoting that story first and foremost, has coming out again saying the deal is getting closer, Tottenham are, are pressing more, developing this, this, this deal, you know, all those kind of buzzing words, it's no longer that we're monitoring it, it's that we're almost there, that it's, it's getting closer. I've got no idea what that means, but or whether he's just trying to continue his own story. To me, the, the fact that Ange Postacoglu said there's no one, no one coming in until we get some players out is probably the more believable narrative. I would imagine that there's still conversations going on about Gift Orban. Maybe the deal might be organised in principle, but nothing will be signed until you know at least three or four players get moved on. We'll talk about that briefly in a moment. The last story for you guys, the last news story is about Everechi Eze. Once again, yesterday this story was popping up and again it's out there in the aggregators this morning that Tottenham are looking at making an offer for the player. But Crystal Palace, now that they've just sold Elise, they were forced into selling Elise because Elise's um, release clause was triggered. And 30 million pound or whatever it was, 31 million pound for him. By the way, as much as I look at Chelsea with a little bit confusion, <laughs> a little bit envy, a little bit suspicion. You know, they've got the greatest accountants in the world. And whilst they might be able to manipulate FFP rules so they stay within the boundaries by, obviously every time they sell a player, they lump the cash on immediately. Every time they buy a player, they amortize it over 10, you know, eight years or whatever, however long these contracts are. You know, at some point, at some point, Chelsea will need to make a profit. Their owner is not just here out of the goodness of his heart spending money. 
They have spent an absolute fortune over the last 18 months, or 12, was it 15 months now since they arrived? And you've, you've got to think that the expectations over Chelsea right now are to, um, you know, to finish in the top four and win a trophy. Anything less than that for this season, I think is, has got to be considered a failure given the amount of turnover of staff and players that's going on, the amount of money that they've spent. Yes, they've, they've raised a lot of money as well, but you've got to set expectations. Look at the, the talent that's come through that door. It would be great fun to be a Chelsea fan right now, but a lot of pressure on Pochettino. We shall see how they get on. And obviously they are banking in order to eventually break even, they are banking on Champions League revenue money. But there's a lot of other teams that are sniffing around those four or five pressure spots. So it's going to be a fascinating season and one that's going to be a real roller coaster for everybody involved. I can't wait to talk about it with you. But anyway, back to Everici SA. I think that the fact that Crystal Palace were going to look at offers around 50 million, 55 million, but now have just sold yet another one of their wonderful talents in Michael Lise. They, they don't need to sell anymore, for sure. And I think on that basis, it would take an eye-watering bid for the player. And look, that's probably looking around £75 million, something like that. And whilst I'd absolutely love to have him, and whilst I'd absolutely love to have owners like, you know, who, who have a, a willingness to show ambition more than Joe Lewis does and Daniel Levy with regards opening the purse strings, I think that... Eze, for me, is a wonderful player, but not a player that I would say is entirely necessary at Tottenham right now. The guy is a midfielder, you know, he's, a, he's an 8 slash 10. Uh, he's an attacking midfielder that's probably, I wouldn't go as far as to call him a 10. I'd call him like an 8. And, you know, he can also play off the left-hand side. Unless you could really see him replacing Sonny, and Sonny being, being played more centrally, which I don't think is necessarily going to utilise his particular skill set in the best in the best way. I'd like to see him played more centrally, but you already have James Madison. Look, wonderful player. Would I love to have him in the squad if it didn't if it didn't affect anything else? Of course. But I just think we've got far more pressing matters at the back, on the right, and up top. And he doesn't cover any of those roles really. So um, I just don't see the feasibility of it. If we were to do that deal, I'll be honest, if we were to do that deal and that was the last deal of the window, it would, it would infuriate me. Don't knock the player, love the player, but it's just, there's priorities. You know, and we don't operate like Chelsea. So, it's a strange one to be linked with him, to be honest. It's a very strange one. I'd be also gobsmacked if Crystal Palace were to sell another one of their, their talents. They've already lost so many. Um, it'll be interesting. Let me know your thoughts. How much of a priority do you think he is? And uh, are, you, are you disappointed about Evan Ferguson? Did you ever think it was reasonable or realistic? Gift Orban looks like it's closer than ever, but it all depends on players that are going out. And in terms of that, on that regard, stories out this morning that Eric Dyer has lots of uh, potential suitors in Portugal and Spain and in England. And so there might be some, some movement there, but nothing concrete, no names, no specific names given. And, you know, the stories have gone very quiet about everybody else. You know, if we're looking to get players out of the door, you, you really want to see and hear the, the details of certain deals getting closer, but none of them are. Pierre Mahoybier's deal's gone quiet. Hugo Lloris, I mean, that's just completely non-existent at the moment. As I say, Davinson Sanchez. Don't know if we've changed our mind as a club on him and see him as more suitable as the third or fourth choice centre-back than, than anybody else. Serge Regalon, nothing to move on. When Ange says on Saturday night or Saturday afternoon, the priority now is to move players out and we've got to Wednesday and there's really no story that's emerging you're starting to get a little bit frustrated when there's only two weeks, two and a half weeks left of the window. You know what I mean? 
I don't know whether or not it's because there's, there's not enough um, not enough chefs that are cooking you know too many chefs spoil the pot so they say it doesn't seem to be that way at Chelsea they've got a lot of people that are doing deals figuring out the maths getting stuff done at Tottenham without Scott Munn and with the inability for Paratici to be directly involved in those meetings or in the negotiations it leaves a lot of uh, a lot on the on the on the desk of Daniel Levy you know and he's someone that doesn't want to let go right he's a control freak but sometimes when there's this much to do and this little time to do it you know it's okay to ask for help anyway that is your news update today guys pending my internet I'm gonna be keeping an eye on the internet this morning if it's as bad as it was yesterday then I might have to put on ice my stream if not then uh, we'll give it a crack and see what happens let me know your thoughts and everything guys like subscribe and comment and as always bye bye